بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. We started last week on al wasiyah al the ninth piece of advice from min wasaya al-salaf al-shabab, some of the advice from the salaf to the youth. And today, or tonight, inshallah, is probably, is probably the last class from this book. And then inshallah, we'll start something else. So today we start with al wasiyah al Asha. That uh, the 10 piece of advice. And again, if we don't know the names of these, of the people narrating, we should write the names down and we should find out who they are. Because it's not, it's a reason that their advice has been collected. It's a reason that time has been taken out to take their statement their statements and gather them into a book. So if we don't know who they are, then we should try to make it our business to find out who they are. Tayyib. Sheikh Abdul Razak, Hafidullah, says, وَمِنْ جُمْلَةٍ وَصَّعِيَ السَّلَفِ الشَّبَابِ مَا جَعَنْ مُحَمَّدْ إِبْنْ سُلْقَى إِبْنْ سُلْقَى Muhammad ibn Sulqa. قال, this is one person, Muhammad ibn Sulqa. He said, Lakiyani Maymoon ibn Mihran. Maymoon ibn Mihran. This is a famous name that comes up a lot in the books of the Salaf. Maymoon ibn Mihran. Fakultu. Hayakallah. Hayakallah. Fakala hadihi tahiyatu shabab. Kun bis salam, eh? Salam. So, this is something that. It's not far-fetched for us because we have uh, greetings, if we say, that we used to saying. So in this case, the man came to Maymoon ibn Mihran and he said to him, Hayakallah, Hayakallah, which in reality, Hayakallah is a dua that's famous and it's a, it's a norm that you hear people saying it all the time in Mecca and Medina and other places. Hayakallah, Hayakum Allah, Allah Hayyik. It's a dua that Allah gives you life. May Allah give you a long life and a strong life. So he came to Maymun ibn Mihran rahimahullah and he said to him, Hayakallah. Faqala. So he responded to him and he said, This is a greeting, or this is the greeting of the youth, the young, as we say. This is something the young bucks say. This is a greeting that the youth was saying. Qud bis salam. When you meet somebody, give them the salams. Because he put the greeting before Hayakallah, which is a dua by itself. He put that, and that's what he said to him before he even gave him the salams. So he said, This is a greeting of the youth. Start off with the salams. Give the salams. And he said, this is taken from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said in the hadith, uh, whoever, whoever begins with general speech, they come to you and they talk to you with general speech before giving the salams, they don't respond to them. It's the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Don't respond to the person who comes to you speaking with general talk and they don't start off with the salams. Not to respond to them. Now, of course it's a hadith, but at the same time, what happens if somebody gives the salams or somebody does that and we don't respond? To our situation, our situation, we sensitive. Everything, the women sensitive, the men sensitive, everybody sensitive. So that could be a bigger problem. Even though it's narrated on the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, it's a sunnah. It's narrated by the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Somebody starts off, a Muslim comes to you, they start talking about everything else, and they don't, they don't even give you the salams, right? And they might be talking about something important, and it might not be important. 
They might be talking about something halal, and they might be talking about something haram. Point being, they start off without the salams. If we ignore that person, sit there and act like we don't hear them, uh, that might be a bigger problem, possibly. So Sheikh Abdul Razak says, the fact that he says this is the greeting of the youth, and again, the youth is not just uh, what we take to be the youth teenagers, right? He says, Ba'da shabab tastatibu nufusuhum nawrin min al-tahiyya. And this is no secret to us. We have things that we say to one another, right? When we greet each other, and we like saying those things to each other. So, right? Huh? We know. We need some examples. Huh? Do we need, if we need examples, we can, you can give examples. What's up? Like, what's up? Yo. Whatever it is, you know. Every part of the city might have a different one and then we share them. Which is not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is putting those statements and them greetings before the salams for the Muslim. Um, There's a famous statement that um, is well known and uh, it goes in what you said. And what they used to say was when somebody came to you and would start speaking before giving the salams, always would say, no kalam without the salam. No kalam without the salam. But I didn't know that was a hadith. <laughs> But yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, listen, that's, that's implementation of the hadith. It's a hadith. It's implementing the hadith, yeah. which is, I mean, inshallah, khair. Hey, that might be a nice way. That might be a nice way of doing it yeah. instead of sitting there acting like the person I talked no, to. No, you just bring it up, like, because I, I had it done before. Muslim brother came in the shop and was like, yeah, Lil. I was like, he's like, yo, hear me talking to you? I said, yeah, then I narrated that. And he was like, oh, man, my bad. Okay, no, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. As long as you can gauge the situation and see, is it going to be a problem? We ain't trying to make no, yeah, no you know, no fit, no problems between each other. But it is what it is. The truth is the truth, and the deen is the deen. So he says that some have greetings that they love to say to each other. And this might be the greeting outside of the salam to them, to the, to a people. That might be the best thing that you could say to a person in that area. The highest form of greeting was known amongst the people might be that. So they love, they say it to each other because they know that it shows love. Whatever the statement is. He said if they do this, it causes them to abandon the salams. They no longer give the salams as-salamu alaykum. But they begin with the other thing, whatever that statement is. We're not trying to make a one specific statement, whatever it is, because you go to a different city, they got something different they say when they meet each other. Whatever that statement is, it says, So they end up starting off conversations with no salams, but they start off whatever, with whatever that statement is. It says, and they might even, it's possible, it says, It's possible that they don't give the salams at all. They might not ever give the salams. They meet each other, they say what they say, they carry a whole conversation on. Then they split ways and they might never, might get, not give the salams at all. Or it might be that they come with the salams after, after they already started speaking, which goes against the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. And other ahadith that show the importance of giving a salam to the Muslims. So in this narration, it shows the importance of sticking to uh, the guidance of the Messenger and starting off with the salams. It says the next piece of advice, number 11. Majar an Abi Malih. Qal Abi Malih. He said, قَالَ لَنَا مَيْمُونَ إِبْنِ مِحْرَانَ He said, while we were sitting around Maymun, the same person, Maymun ibn Mihran, وَنَحْنُ حَوْلَهُ We're all sitting around Maymun ibn Mihran. قَالَ So Maymun said, يَا مَعْشَرَ الشَّبَابِ قُوَّتُكُمْ اِجْعَلُوهَا فِي شَبَابِكُمْ 
ونشاتكم في طاعة الله. He said to him, while they were all sitting around him, your strength and your activity and your youth, those youthful years, those youthful years, which go up to what? When do the youthful years stop? 40, and some say past 40. So this is not for 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 20-year-olds. It's not for them only. He said, those years, spend them. He said, spend them being active in worshiping Allah Jalla Wa'ala. Number one. Spend those years in being active in worshiping Allah Jalla Wa'ala, being obedient to Allah. And then he said, Ya Ma'ashara Shuyukh. And he addressed the, uh, the, older, the older men that were there also. He says, Ya Ma'ashara Shuyukh. And for the older ones, the Shuyukh that are here, Hatta Mata. Basically, when you going to start? For the elders, when? When you going to start? So he addressed two people, Maymoon in this narration. He addressed the younger crowd and advised them to spend that youth, spend that youth trying to get closer to Allah and worship. And to the older crowd, he said, Hatta Mata. Meaning, what are you waiting for? What is a person waiting for? He says, to what point is a person going to wait to start being obedient and upright? To the point that a person allows time and years and years to go by without being obedient to Allah. So he says, bringing two, two points. One for the younger crowd and one for the older crowd. The younger crowd not to be deceived into thinking that we have time. And the older crowd not to be deceived into thinking that at the same time they have time. That there is no time except for the time we have now. So he says to the youth, spend your younger years, spend these years worshiping Allah and obedience to Allah. And to the older ones, don't waste your time, don't wait. And another narration, An Firyabi Qab, Kana Sufyan Athori. Sufyan Athori. The two Sufyans, right? Sufyan Athori, and who's the other one? Sufyan ibn Riyana. Sufyan ibn Riyana. Sufyan Athori, rahimahullah. He said, Can Sufyan Athori, you salli, thumma yaltafitu ila shabab fa yaqul. He says, Sufyan Athori, uh, he would pray and then he would turn around after the salat and he would say to the shabab, Ida lam tu sallu liyom famata. If you don't start praying now, if you don't pray now, then when are you going to pray? If you don't pray now, then when are you going to pray? And Sheikh Abdul Razak, he explains it to me, if you don't benefit from your years, then you, you, you have your strength. The years that the body is at its peak, mobility-wise, movement, strength, energy, all of the senses are strong. If a person doesn't pray and use that time, as he says, If a person doesn't spend no, that time when they have their strength in worship of Allah, making sajda to Allah, he says, They could become, as the time comes, when they could become weak. And then a person enters into a stage of their life where they wish. And if we don't know this, then we should talk to the older brothers and sisters who pray in chairs. A person may enter into a stage of their life where they wish that they could get on the ground and make such that lack and lies to clear, but they're not able to. A time comes, a person, they lose their strength. We start off weak, Allah creates us weak, Babies, infants, children can't feed, can't do anything on our own. We grow into strong adults. And if Allah gives us the age to reach old age, we become weaker again. To the fact some people can't walk, or they can't walk up steps, or they can't sit for too long, or they can't stand for too long, right? Uh, that their weakness comes back. It says that a person may enter into a time of their life where they lose their strength, or they become sick, something happens. Something happens where they're not able 
even if they wanted to make sajda, they can't make sajda even if they wanted to. And this is why it said, إِذَا لَمْ تُصَلُّوا الْيَوْمْ فَمَتَى If you don't pray today, when are you going to pray? If you don't pray when you got all your strength and your senses, and you're mobile, and you have all the activity in front of you, then when are you going to make it your business to pray? When you enter into the stage of your week, where there's less of a chance that you can stand for Tarawih. When you're weaker and there's less of a chance that you can stand at night and pray. There's less of a chance you can move around and get up early enough to make it to Salat al-Fajr. And some people, they need, some, some of the old heads say they need warm-up time. Right? They can't just jump up out of bed, make wudu and run to the masjid. No, they got to get up early. They need extra time for the body to adjust to getting up there early. So they might not even make it. They wake up at a certain time in the morning, they can't, they're not gonna make the Salat of Fajr in the message. Because their body doesn't allow them. So he says, if you're not gonna pray now when you have all of these, all of this ability, then when are you gonna pray? Which is a reminder that we don't have time to waste. I mean, this is a short book. This book is only 20, 28 pages. And there are books and books and books and volumes filled with these same type of narrations. But inshallah, this is enough. He says, in the 12th piece of advice, or number 13, Maja'an Rabi'ah, Rabi'ah, Ibn Kulthum, and Nuhuqan, Nadra ilayna al Hassan, that Hassan al Basri, Rahimahullah, he looked to us, but Nahlu Hawlahu Shabab, we were all young around him. So he said to him, Ya Ma'ashar al Shabab, Ama Tashtaqun ila Hawl al Ain. <laughs> he said, don't y'all hope for those virgins in paradise? Don't you wish and hope for that? And he says that this is يذكر فيه شباب نعيم الجنة So he's using here a technique reminding them of the, the, the benefits and the rewards in paradise. Don't y'all hope? Don't you hope to get those Rewards of paradise. All of the things that Allah has promised us in al Jannah, don't you hope for that? And he says, he does this in order to encourage them to work hard in order to get to paradise. That it takes work. And it takes work. He says, وَإِذَا قَامَ هَذَا فِي قَلْبِ الشَّابِ دَفْعَهُ بِبَعْدَ تَوْفِيكِ اللَّهِ لِتَعَالِ الْإِجْتِهَافِ الْعَمَالِ الْآخِرَةِ he said, if a person, if a person understands this in their heart, then it'll push them, it should push them with Allah's permission and tawfiq is from Allah, it should push them to work harder. To work harder in order to achieve the ultimate goal of paradise to be saved from the hellfire. He says, after that, also, Hassan al Basri rahimahullah. Qala ya ma'ashar al shabab. Iyakum wa taswif. Sofa af'al, sofa af'al. He said, Beware of procrastination and delaying and saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Right? Iyakum wa taswif. And Sheikh Abdul Razak says, to sweep, to procrastinate, he says, this is a defect in a person. This is a deficiency. This is not something that's uh, praiseworthy, procrastinating. This is something that is a defect. It's a flaw. It's a mistake from a person. That many people, uh, they wasted some precious time. They wasted precious time procrastinating. Allah forgive us. So, he says, as some people say, sofa atu. And the word sofa means I'm going to do something in the future. I'm going I'm to I'm repent. I'm going to make toba. I'm going to make toba. Not right now. I'm not rushing to make toba and seek Allah's forgiveness now, but I'm going to do it in the future. I'll, I'll make toba. Or sofa or hafid ala salat. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start praying all the time. Not now they're talking about. They're not talking about right now. They're talking about in the future. Or I'm going to start being good to my parents. 
It says, فَلَا يَفْعَلْ وَلَا يُبَادِرْ وَلَا يَفْعَلْ But they don't rush to do it. They don't rush to do that. They don't rush to do it. And they don't take advantage of that time. بَلْ يُعَجِّلْ But you're sober. But they procrastinate in doing it. They put it off. And every time that they think about doing it, that they what? They procrastinate again. They procrastinate again. And they continue to procrastinate. They keep procrastinating and putting stuff off until that time. Them golden years leave them and they miss out on all of the barakah, the blessing in that time. He says, and it's possible, it's possible that what? They keep saying they're going to make toba, but who's promised? Who's promised tomorrow? to be able to make Torah, to ever repent to Allah to our time. Nobody's promised, and none of us know if we want to make it to the, live till tomorrow, to seek Allah's forgiveness. So he says it's possible that before they're able to repent to Allah, because they're procrastinating, they keep putting it off, and keep putting it off, and they think they have time, he says it's possible that they die qabla an yasila, ila dhalik al umma. As it might sound crazy, but there's some people that say when I reach 40, when I turn 40, that's when I'm going to really start praying. I'm going to really start praying when I reach 40. I'm going to really start praying on such and such birthday. On my 50th. On my 50th birthday is when I'm really turning up. I'm stopping everything. I'm going to do this. But it's no guarantee that a person is going to reach 50. And that's why in the previous advice, in that piece of poetry they brought, they said that don't be deceived by a person, another person's longevity. The fact that Allah gave another person 80 years, don't think that you have 80 years. As most of the people that die, most people that die are not 80 and 90. Most people that die are in their younger years. Most people that die are not 100 years old. How many people reach 100 years old? The majority of people walking around are not in their 90s, are not in their 80s. Most people that die are in their younger years. So he said, don't be deceived by the fact that somebody reaches 75 to 80 years old. So a person thinks, well, there are two people in their family, a person in their family lived to be 95. There's another person in their family that's 85 years old. So they think it runs in the family, All right? That's shaitan is deceptive. They think that longevity, long lifespans run in my family, so I'm good. I got at least, I know I got at least, what? 75 to 80 years. Why you say that? Well, my grandfather's 85. My other grandfather died, he was 89. My grandmother was 92. Right? My mother right now is 76. So a person thinks, being deceived by the shaitan, that they have time. And that's why he brought that piece of poetry that one person's age harms a whole people. Because they're deceived by the shaitan and believing they have time that they don't have. Um, I suppose what you said, a person saying, I'm going to wait till I turn 50 to do this, or I'm going to wait till I turn 40 to do that. Is that different from a person saying, I turned 40, now it's time to turn it up? Like they start to increase because they get older. That's different. That's not, one person is not being obedient anyway. Right? One person is upon disobedience already. They're not praying. They don't pray. Right? They might pray during Ramadan and the rest of the year. Right? And they know they're wrong. Right? And then they say, when I turn this age, that's when I'm a really... There's people that do that. They have a set age. They say, when I turn 40, for example, that's when I'm going to start praying all five every day. I'm going to start doing everything I'm supposed to do. Not like the person who is already trying to be obedient, they're praying, they're doing everything they're supposed to do, but they see themselves getting older. And if they're getting older, that means what? If you're close to death, that means I'm running out of time. Right? The older I get, that's why one of the names of my mistake, Hassan Basri, said that every day that you live, that a peace dies. Right? The person gets older and they say, right, I'm such and such, I gotta do more, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. That's not the same as the person who's disobeying Allah and then they make it their business when they hit a certain age that they're gonna, as they say, 
do more, or they're gonna step it up. Thank you. The last piece of advice, John Hafsa bin Sirin. Hafsa bin Sirin. If we don't know Hafsa bin Sirin, then we should look her up. You know Hafsa bin Sirin, alhamdulillah. Hafsa bin Sirin, which is another point uh, that if our sisters don't know, if our sisters or brothers don't know, that if you read the biography in the lives of the Salaf, there were women who were to Labyrinth. That there were women who were learned sisters. They dedicated their lives to Halabadim. All the stories are not about men. They're not all about men. They're not all the stories are not about men. But there are women who went down the same path. And there's something that is, or it should be, Islamically, I don't know about Indina with us. But seeking knowledge, Islamically, is something that is praiseworthy. It's praiseworthy if your wife wants to seek knowledge. She wants to learn Islam. It's praiseworthy if our daughters want to memorize Quran and memorize Hadith. And they want to memorize and they want to be students of knowledge. And they might want to be go past that and be from the uh, or the man, the female scholars. As there are female scholars in Islamic, in Islamic history, there are. Starting with who? Aisha, the wife of the Prophet That the example is there for our sisters, so we shouldn't, and it's not, it's not restricted to men, and we shouldn't try to restrict it to our sons. Seeking knowledge should not be restricted to our sons. And we leave the women to, as we say, what? Be women? The men gotta be men, right? Follow him with a wife, don't take care of his wife. Don't take care of his family. So a male student now don't take care of his family. That's cool. Nah, that ain't cool. Either way, if you seek it now, he still got a responsibility. If she's a woman and she seeks now, she still has a responsibility. We shouldn't restrict it to that only the men. It's only to allow them to the men. You just get ready to get married, sis. You just stay here and do women stuff. Right? And if we do that, what happens is, realistically, when she gets married, the people who take advantage of women. Because what? She has no idea. She doesn't know anything. She's barely making it with the knowledge. And he don't really know anything, but he knows a little more than her. So he's able to take advantage of her. Hafsa bin Sirin, anna her qala, that she say, Ya ma'ashir al-shabab, khudu min anfusikum wa antum shabab. فَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُ الْعَمَلْ إِلَّا فِي الشَّبَابِ She said, O oh youth, take, she said, uh, benefit, benefit, خُذُوا مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Benefit from yourselves while you're young. السلام رحمة الله عليكم. Benefit while you're young. Then she said, I swear by Allah that I haven't seen any action greater than in the time of a person's youth. I haven't seen any action greater than in the time of a person's youth. A, that that time is the greatest time of a person's life. And he says, in If a person is blessed by Allah to take advantage of that time. Because a person could be young and they never take advantage of their youth. Like many of us. Many of us, we know, we know that we spent a lot of time doing a lot of things that either A, we shouldn't have been doing, B, it was no benefit in doing it, or maybe C, stuff that got us in trouble. It caused us to lose more time. So she says that uh, if a person is blessed to be from the people who take care of their time, then this is a nirma, this is a blessing from Allah. And that a person who does that, that they will receive and they will uh, gain the barakah in that time. As opposed to the person who doesn't take care of that time, who doesn't benefit from those years, this person, as Sheikh Abdul Razak says, that they find <coughs> that an action that they were doing in their youth, those youthful years, it was something that they loved to do. It was something that they loved to do. They found it amusing. It was something decent to do, right? فَلَمَّا كَبُرْ فِي 
But when they get older, that same thing that they love to do, they find that that same thing now is a punishment for them. It's a punishment. In their younger years, it was something that they loved to do, the nefs. That they would spend time doing it, and it was something that they loved to spend their time doing, and then when they get older and they look back, once that time is gone that you can't get back, we can't get that time back, he says, when the person gets old, capital of his sin, that they find it, that same action is now, they find it and they look at it as a punishment. They look at it as a punishment. He says, so ending that this marhala, the, that those golden years, we'll call them, of the youth, is something that the Muslim, this young belly, that the Muslim uh, takes care and strives to work hard and taking advantage of that time. Taking advantage of that time, he says, Musta'inin billahi azza wa jal, talib al madda wa auna wa tawfiqa. Not that just a person does that, but along with that, that a person seeks Allah's help, making dua to Allah, and seeking Allah's tawfiq, and seeking his aid in taking advantage of the time. It says, وَأَن يُذَكِّرَ النَّفْسَهُ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى سَائِلَهُ عَنْ هَذِهِ الْمَرْحَلَ سُؤَالًا عَظِيمًا يَوْمَ يَلْقَاهُ And again, he said a person should remind themselves, and we need to remind each other that, in the hadith that he mentioned in the beginning of the book, the Prophet said, we're going to be asked about five things. And in that hadith, he specified, he said a person's life, he mentioned a person's life in general, and then he specified the time of a person's youth, those youthful years we're going to be asked about specifically. So he said with that, that a person should understand we're going to be asked about that time specifically, so we need to take advantage of those years. And with that is the end of this book. And we'll read just a small benefit that's connected to this from Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh Hafidullah. In a talk he did called Him to Salaf fi Talab al Ilm. The high aspirations that the Salaf had when they were learning, when they were seeking knowledge. And these stories are not just stories to read, but it's stories that we should look at ourselves and say, if I love the Salaf, what am I doing? Where am I compared to them? What do I do compared to what they did? Where am I? How do I stand? And in this talk, he mentioned sabr, being patient when learning. That number one, it doesn't happen overnight. But he mentioned something specific here that is important connected to the topic. So he says, After discussing the importance of having a sincere intention, which is the most important thing when we come to learn. When we come to learn, the most important thing is that we're sincere. We're not looking for a pat on the back from nobody. Not from our wives, not from our husbands, not from our children, not from the brothers and sisters of the man. We don't need a pat on the back from anybody. That we should be learning, trying to get closer to Allah Jalla wa and if we don't understand what that looks like, then we have to search a little deeper, look a little deeper. Do we care? You gotta ask yourself, do I care who comes to class and who doesn't come to class? Do I care who else is benefiting or who else is not benefiting? Am I worried about people or am I worried about myself? Am I worried about me learning? As Imam Ahmed said, am I worried about removing the ignorance from myself or am I worried about people seeing me remove the ignorance from myself? What's important to me? So after he discussed the niyyah, he says, the second thing that a person, the talib of him, the person learning, he has to know, and ya'lam anna tariq al-ilm laysa bil qasir, that the path of knowledge is nothing short, it's not a short path. Tariq al-ilm tawil jiddin, that it's a very long path. بَلْ هُوَ مَعَ الْإِنسَانِ مُنْذُ أَنْ يَبْدَأْ فِي الْعِلْمِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَقْضِيَ اللَّهِ أَمْرٌ كَانَ مَفْعُولًا بِوَفَاتِهِ That a person learning, it's not a short path, but it's a path that starts whenever a person starts out to learn, whenever they start learning, that they're on that path until death, until Allah calls them back. And this is why Imam Ahmed, رحمه الله, we all know Imam Ahmed, bin Hamdul, right? 
What was Imam Ahmed Rahim Allah famous for? The mihna. Huh? The mihna. The mihna, which is what? Uh, uh, declaring that the Quran was the word of Allah. The, the trial of the Quran being created, that the people during his time, they were saying that the Quran was created, and he stood up for Ahl Sunnah, the belief of Ahl Sunnah. Like, what else was he famous for, Imam Ahmed? Mm. That's an event. That's an event. That the Mehda, the trial is one event in Imam Ahmed's life. But he's known, Imam Ahmed bin Abdul is known for the Musnad, his collection of hadith. What else? Imam Ahmed bin Hamdul, Imam, they call him the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The nickname, the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, what is he famous for? He has a Muslim, a collection of hadith. Tayyib. He's a scholar of hadith. Tayyib. He's the Mujaddid. The Mujaddid. Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala. But he's nicknamed Imam Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Imam Ahmad is not, he's known for the mihna. He's known for aqidah. Imam in aqidah. He's known as the imam in hadith. He's known as the imam in fiqh. Right? Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. Ahmad bin Hamdan. The fourth imam, time was after Imam Abu Hanifa, and after Imam Malik, and after Imam al Shafi, was Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. That they said Imam Ahmed, when he was old, he was in his older years. He wasn't a young. The people during that time, the Tulab of him, they were known, the students of knowledge were known because they used to carry around, you know that inkwell? The joint you dip the pen in? They used to carry that around. Right? Huh? Yes, there you go. They used to carry that around. That's how they would write. They would carry that around in the street. But this was a sign of who? The younger students. Imam Ahmed was an imam at the time. People traveling from countries to the city. Right? So somebody saw him in the street carrying it. And they said, You, the imam, you carrying the mehbah, you carrying the inkwell, as if you're a small student. It shows us that it's not about how much you learned already. You learned a whole bunch, but that don't mean you reached any level. We shouldn't feel like we reached any level. He's the Iman. He said only the small students carry that. And that's when he made the statement, He said, I'm going to be carrying this inkwell until I go to the grave. I'll be carrying the inkwell until I go to the grave. This is the seller. Nobody's, you don't find in the biographies any attitude or mentality that I did enough. I did a strong 30 long Ramadan. I don't gotta make up no days. I prayed all five, I prayed tall away every night. So after the Eid, what? I'm cool, I can go back and go back to certain places, go back to doing certain, go back to talking to people. You never find that. So he said, it's with them until a person's dying. This, the next part is the, the point of mentioning it. He said, this, the patience here, a person has to have patience, he said, in jihad team, in two aspects. A person has to have patience when they're learning from two aspects. He said, firstly, that learning is a form of worship. Seeking knowledge, learning is a form of ibadah. And every ibadah, every type of worship, a person needs patience when doing every type of worship. Now the question is, what makes learning, what makes seeking knowledge worship? What makes it worship? How is that worship? We know Salah is worship. We know the five pillars, Hajj, Fast Ramadan. What makes Talib al what makes seeking knowledge, going to a circle of knowledge to learn about Allah, and to learn about his message, alayhi salatu salam, and to learn the ahkam, the rulings of Islam, what makes that ibadah? Huh? Yeah, it's a serious question. Huh? Again? So you can implement what Allah commands you. 
by what that makes it worship? How do we know? Let me rephrase the question. Go ahead, Father. Because Ibn Taymiyyah, like Allah, he like said uh, that worship is a comprehensive term that comprises everything that pleases Allah, and the proof of it is for the Indian Salat. Everything, everything that ibadah, ibadah is not restricted to the five pillars. We know that's worship, but ibadah is everything. It's a ism jamir, it's a comprehensive word, it includes a lot of stuff. Everything that Allah is pleased with, from statements, from what we say to what we do. Everything that pleases Allah from what we say and what we do, whether you can see me doing it or you can't see me doing it. So you can see a person praying, right? You can see a person making hajj, but you can't see a person's tawakkul. You can't see a person's trust in Allah. You can't see a person's love for the Messenger, Of course, if they do certain actions, whatever's in your heart should it should manifest, it should come out in, in the way a person behaves and what they do. But you can't look at a person and say, no, nah, that person right there, uh, because it cloths, sincerity is in the heart. You can't look at a person and just say, he or she not sincere, based on what? Right? Actions of the heart can't be seen. So worship is anything that is loved by Allah. Anything that is loved or is pleasing to Allah, whether it's a statement, something we say or something we do, whether it's clear, it's apparent, people can see you doing, doing it, but you can't see you doing it. Or, another way to know, that anything that Allah Jalla commands us with, or the promise of Allah Islam commands us to do, we know that it is a bad thing. Because Allah doesn't command us to do something that He is not pleased with. So, seeking knowledge is worship. It's worship. From the fact that Messenger Allah Islam 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 said, Talib al Farid ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. What level, what level of knowledge does a person have to have to know? The basics, the things that you need, everything that we need to operate as Muslims every day. How to pray, how to make wudu, who is Allah? What is Tawheed? What is your basics? Does that mean every Muslim walking around has to memorize Kitab al Tawheed? Does that mean you can't understand Allah? You can't, a person can't understand what is Tawheed without memorizing Kitab al Tawheed? It doesn't mean that. Is it better to understand and memorize those books? That's, that's better, but that's another level. Everybody's not on that level to memorize books, let alone memorize the Quran, the best book. And after that, memorize different books that have been gathered in different subjects that every Muslim has to know with no excuse the things that they're able to practice on a daily basis and live like a Muslim. Which is wudu, istinja, ghusl, salah, the pillars of the salah, the conditions for the salah, all of those things that uh, we need to live on a daily basis. He says, so the first thing we have to learn that uh, patience, patience from one aspect, every type of worship needs patience. So learning these patience. He says, well, Amr al-Thani, and this is the point. He says, a person has to have a sabr ala thabat, ala suluki talibinan. A person has to be patient when it comes to staying on the path of seeking knowledge. Staying on the path of learning. Meaning what? Let's use Ramadan because that's probably the easiest example. It's easy during Ramadan. Classes during Ramadan are before iftar. Right? If we break at 8 o'clock, class at 7.30. Everybody coming to eat anyway. So a person says what? Right? Hopefully, a person says, well, I'm going to the masjid anyway to break fast. It's Ramadan, everybody dina. I'm going to pray anyway. So let me go a little earlier and sit in class and benefit. Right? It's class every day at 7.30. I'm just go early, get some benefit, break fast. It's going to be an iftar anyway. Such and such spots in the iftar. Food banging. I'm going to go down there and go a little early get some benefit with the class. That only lasts for how long? No. 30 days. You got 29 to 30 days. After that, what? You on your own. 
right? That incentive, that push might not be there, right? Which is, you know, the if time. It might not be there, it's not there anymore. So a person has to have patience that it's gonna take some fighting. The jihad and nafs that we'll never talk about. That we gotta fight against our own desires to get up and go to class. Get there and there's nobody there. You get there, you're the only one there, right? He says, that this learning, this path to learning, I, I like to say learning because it doesn't mean, talab al doesn't always mean, seeking eyes don't always mean you got to get on the plane. Again, the people who were the strongest in my class are people who learned in their countries before they came. They sat with the people and learned in their countries and then they came to Mecca. And they were generally, they were the strongest people in the class. They didn't say, you know, they just up and went there not knowing anything. And now he mentions something specific that it takes patience when learning. So he says, you need patience when learning. And he says, halbo sabr fi durus faqat la. Is it only patient? Does a person just have to be patient with what? This is the reality. A class, even early in they teach a class, for example, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam. Almost early in they teach a class, they don't teach one day a week. They teach, a lot of them teach five, six days a week. But let's just say, you're going to sit in, he's explaining Sahih al-Bukhari, right? He's explaining Sahih al-Bukhari from beginning to end. Or he's explaining the Quran, Tafsir, from Al-Fatiha to An-Nas. One day a week. You know how long it generally takes to finish? And those are, volume, those are volumes of books. If you're doing a regular book, you know how long it takes generally to finish one book on a shaykh? One book? Because the class is once a week. Anybody know? How long does it take generally to finish a book on a shaykh? Cover to cover. Generally, media, uh, normal size, but I say two years. Maybe a little more. Two years that you gotta go there on Mondays after Mother Day for two years to finish that book on shit. One book, that's one book. One book, two years. It ain't for everybody. Everybody can't hang in there. That's why if you ask anybody, when Sheikh Fulan, the first day of class, Sheikh having class the first day, the sign goes up, it's packed. All the classes like that, it's packed out like packed. Second class, it's a little less. Third class, it's a little less. A month in, maybe one line. Right, that one line, they shrink down, depending on the class, right? And it's gonna stay like that for what? Two years. That group of people, not everybody can hang in. It's subtle, it takes patience. That means you're spending time away from your family, time away from your kids, time away from this, 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 along with work, along with the responsibilities that gotta be covered. Responsible, no, the wadget. There's no missing out on the wadget. Food still has to be put on the table, people got doctor's appointments, right? All of that stuff still has to be done. And at the end of the day, you're sitting there for two years for one book, that's just one book, let alone the shape that book that the shape is teaching on Wednesday, or if he's teaching on Friday. Right? He says, is it patience just in that? That's just one area of sabr. He says, sabr fi mulazimatin is it just, because outside of class, that's outside of that, just being close and try to be in contact with early man, you got questions. What if you don't get your questions answered at the class? That means you gotta be in contact with the sheikh. How you get in contact with the sheikh? Well, sometimes you gotta go. You have to go and find out where does the sheikh pray. You gotta go where he prays. He might live across town. You gotta go there and pray with him. Right? Go there and pray this message. That's what happens when you get there. Huh? It's a bunch of people there doing the same thing you're doing, or so therefore you don't get your question answered. So what you say? I'm gonna come back. Or you get there and what? Shake's not there. So what you do? I went to pray mother with him, he not with him, I'm gonna do? 
I'm gonna just wait and pray Isha. He'll be here for Isha. <laughs> Guess what happened at Isha? Uh, Shane ain't there. So, that means I gotta do what? Come back. How many times you think that happened? Uh, Subba. What are you gonna say? I ain't gonna shake no beat. I ain't messing with like shake. I'm going over here. He might be teaching. You know he had a class on that day somewhere else. Right? Is it just in that aspect that he says, well, some of the and is it just being patient, listening? As right now the internet is, right? The internet is, you can find classes all over the internet. But some of the audio is not that good. Right? So then you gotta keep putting it back. You can't really understand it. The person gets frustrated. And what they do, close it out. You're going back to that. Shaitan is deceptive. That's why you know, Joe's got him a lot. He got a book called Tablis Iblis. Deceptions of the Shaitan. And it's not, the deceptions of the Shaitan are not on, not only on the people who are disobeying Allah, on the people who are obedient, on the rebel, the worshipers. That he deceives the worshipers sometimes in the going overboard in worship. Going beyond what the Prophet son laid out for us. And he even goes in the deception of some of the ulama, scholars of hadith, scholars of fiqh. So he says after that, he said, is it only in these areas that a person has to be patient? He says, la bella sabr, sabr ala Allah yashghaluhu ala al-ilma huwa duna. He said, but a person has to be patient and not being busy with things that will take them away from knowledge. Tayyip. Like have to be patient and not busy in ourselves with things that's going to take us away from learning. Tayyip, it don't mean that it's haram necessarily. It could be, it might not be. It might be permissible. It might be something that is praiseworthy. But if a person wants to learn, it has to be some dedication. It has to be some dedication, just like we dedicate ourselves to anything else that we see to be important. Whatever we deem to be important, we make a level of dedication to that thing. So now he gives an example. And he says, the things that pull a person away from learning, he says, This is the greatest thing that will be found that keeps a person from learning. That there are things that they busy themselves with and it keeps them away from learning. He says, He said, especially when you're younger. Especially when a person is younger. It's for have a sin. And this is the point I mentioned in this whole narration for this. He said, when a person is younger, he said, It's possible that your close friends busy you from benefit. They busy you from learning. Ain't no love loss. Ain't that we don't love each other. But it's possible that your close friends distract you from learning. And it don't mean that we got to turn around and start looking at people funny. Like, he, like they intentionally, he might not intentionally do it. But the reality is the reality. He said it's possible that the person, close friends, hinder a person from learning. Or just things that the heart desires. It doesn't necessarily mean things are haram all the time, right? For example, a person may like just, for example, taking walks, nature hikes. It's not wrong with that. It's jiggy, right? <laughs> it ain't nothing wrong with that. Looking at a lost creation, exercise, right? It's nothing wrong with that. That's real soft, brother. Right? There's people who do it. It's a lot of things. There ain't nothing wrong with that. It's benefit, right? Or let's say working. Somebody work. And that's obligatory. You got your obligatory. If you got family and stuff to take care of, you got a, you know you got a certain amount. Like, I have to do this in order to support my family. But what about the extra, the overtime, right? Overtime halal. Nothing wrong with overtime. You just miss for overtime. But it could be that it distracts a person so much that they lose their connection with Allah, right? It could be anything. It doesn't necessitate that stuff is haram in itself, but the shaitan 
to enter on a person from the things that we love. I love this, it's a permissible thing to do, but it carries me to go overboard where I forget my obligation to Allah. I forget my obligation to learning. It takes me away from learning, it takes me away. I used to be able to go to class on these days, but now, right, I picked up another day knowing what I love, so I'm gonna need a class off for a while. And then what, a person though we know, you get too far away, you feel your iman dropping. I know I was stronger when I was in class. I'm doing what I love to do, but I know I was stronger when I was in class, right? He said there are many things that take a person away from that path. He says, تَأْخُذْ مِنْ هَذِهِ حَظًّا لَكِنْ بِحِيْفٍ لَا تَجْغَلُكَ عَنِ الْإِنْ He said those things that are perfectly love. He said, there's nothing wrong with them. Take from them a portion. But don't take away so much. Don't put so much time in it that it takes you away from being able to learn and benefit. And that is balance. That's balance, that we gotta be balanced. We can't, and we're not trying to. It's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, not trying to make everybody students of knowledge that you gotta get on. I'm not saying that. But there are some uh, basic things that we all should know. The basic things that all the Muslims should know. How we live life as Muslims daily, day to day, and we don't really know if we're doing basic worship right. We don't really know if we understand the Tawheed and the Shirk correctly. We don't really know how to worship correctly. We don't really know how to deal with our wives. The wives don't know how to deal with the husbands. We don't know, can I do this with my oldest and can I? Can I give gifts to this one? Can I? How do we live every day and don't know the basics? That's the problem. Not that everybody, because everybody ain't gonna happen. Everybody's not getting on the plane to leave. Everybody's not coming to class. That's just reality, it is what it is. But there has to be a respect for knowledge at the least. There has to be some respect for knowledge. And we close with that, inshallah ta'ala. And if we don't respect knowledge, we're gonna continue to have problems. We're gonna continue to have problems and confusion. And again, I saw people who, if they came here, I saw people in Mecca, if they came here, knowing us, me knowing my people, if they came here, we wouldn't probably wouldn't give them the salams. More than probably would not return the salams. Right? But them people, they respect any. They respect the sheikh. They respect the Imam that leads the salam. They respect the teachers in the message. They respect them. They have a respect for knowledge. Are they the most knowledgeable? No. But guess what they do? They make it a point to make sure their children do better than them. They make it a point to make sure their children are better than them. So no, they don't learn. They don't know that much Quran. But they make sure that their children get to Quran class. Even if they gotta pay somebody to drive them there every day. Respect for it, respect for knowledge. That a lot of us, a lot of us, the type of environment we come from, we don't respect knowledge. We don't respect knowledge, we don't respect people who are educated. That's a problem. And that's not something that Islam teaches us. Islam doesn't teach us that. That's something that we came up, we were raised on. It's a societal thing, a, a thing that we learned in society that the smart people, they're not really the thoroughest people. The sharpest people in the class, they're not really the thoroughest in the neighborhood. Around the way, they're not the thoroughest people. Around the way, the thorough people are the ones who don't go to school on the corner all day, right? We gave more respect to them people, right? We didn't give respect to the one who got the highest grades. And I gotta mention that because it's a problem that we carry over into the dean. We carry that same mentality over into the slam, so we think the people, and there's no disrespect, and it got nothing to do with that. We think the people or will use the fact that a person didn't graduate from an Islamic university. <laughs> we'll use that, well look at such as he ain't graduated, look at that. What type of standard is that? And there's nothing against the person who didn't graduate because every person, every taller in gets exactly what the law wrote for him. And he's no aim, there's nothing embarrassing about it. Nobody goes above what the law's written for. 
That's why when somebody asked Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh about being a half of the Quran, he said, everybody who seeks knowledge, they don't come out to be a sheikh. They don't come out to be strong. They don't come out to be a hafiz. Everybody don't reach that level. Everybody gets exactly what Allah decreed for them to get. So it's nothing to eat. It ain't nothing to embarrass a person that's finished. That's what Allah decreed. Some people didn't finish. Some people finished. Some people went further. That's by Allah's decree. Qadr. We believe in the Qadr. Qadr Allah ma shafa. But how do we use the gauge? What's the gauge? The gauge, we supposed to be shooting high. We should be shooting high. Our joint is still, well, you don't have to be learned, you can still, we still trying to finagle it. You could, you don't really got it. Why not? Why wouldn't you go for the gusto, as you said? We still be short, short-sighted. You scared, as a brother said, if you scared to fail, you scared to reach because you scared you might fail. We don't like being failures. We don't like, uh, we don't like people to see us fail. And if we carry on like that, it's going to be hard to learn. Because you're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. If you're scared to make a mistake, you're scared to fail at something, you're going to be hard to get far, to get ahead. People who move, they did stuff wrong. They corrected and they kept moving. When you sit back and you tell me, you know what, I ain't saying that because I don't want nobody to know I don't really know. You ain't going to learn. All right? There's plenty of times I had to read in class. <laughs> Right? I made mistakes. The whole class is laughing. You know what I feel like for everybody laughing? You know, I don't even know they laughed. I thought it was right. I thought I read it right. Right? It's true, but when I read it wrong, it changed the whole meaning. I mean, it can't. It can't mean that. Once I went back, I said, oh, right. that, don't mean, that makes no sense. Right? But I'll never forget that. It's a learning experience. If you're scared to make a mistake, then we're gonna continue, continue not knowing. We should not be okay. It's not okay, and we shouldn't think it's okay. And Islam doesn't make it okay for us to be uneducated. The fact that we come up on that and that's what we was used to is one thing. Do that mean it's right? It doesn't mean it's right, it doesn't make it right because that's what we're used to. We'll stop there, unless there's any questions. Uh, inshallah, after. After the Eid, uh, we're going to start another book, inshallah ta'ala. Probably won't be next Wednesday, though. More than likely, it won't be next Wednesday, probably the week after that, inshallah ta'ala. Questions? Tayyib wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakhu wa bina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam. Somebody call me the man. Somebody got to do it, Shaq. We waiting on you.